it's not like you're walking into a place where you have no idea what's going to happen. No, you've already spent time with your family and friends um, at this time of the year. So you already know what you don't like. You know, you, re you already know what you're fearing. You already know what kind of what your needs are. So that's good. Welcome back to Happiness and Progress. I'm your host, Danielle Craig. I'm an Emmy Award winner, former journalist, mom, wife, and just a person looking for more joy in the everyday. This podcast is brought to you by the Mail Tribune. Here I talk about different ways to bring more joy into your life, from gaining perspective and building relationships to dealing with hardships and improving your health. And today talking about the holidays because during the holiday season, for some of us, it means not only pumpkin pie and gratitude, but dealing with difficult family members. Are you there? Can you raise your hand to this one? I am so excited to share this episode with you because I think this is so valuable to so many people. My guest today is Stephanie Essenfeld. She's practiced family psychology and therapy for the last eight years. Her goal is to provide helpful tools for effective communication, empathy, boundaries, decision-making, and many more skills, and a lot of that we talk about today. You can find Stephanie on Instagram at Therapy Untangled. This episode will offer you real, tangible tools you can use this Thanksgiving and throughout December as you deal with family members and really in your daily life. We talk about how to set boundaries with your family members, determining what your needs are, and how to check your expectations. We also went through some difficult family dynamics, some different scenarios, parents and adult children, dealing with in-laws and sibling rivalries. There's so much great insight here. I hope you love this episode, so let's get to it. So I want to talk specifically about the holidays and those family relationships during holidays. And of course, I think that the tools we talk about today can probably be taken uh, any time when dealing with difficult family members throughout the year. But when you are, you know you are going to a holiday situation and you're going to be dealing with someone difficult in your family, do you have any tools that they can take with them? Yes, of course. The holidays is a very special um, season. Um, pra uh, private practices from therapists actually get flooded <laughs> because, yeah, it's a time where there's a lot of demands coming mm -hmm. from all directions. And, you know, you have your family, your partner's family, if you have a partner and friends, like everybody wants to make plans with you or, or the contrary, you can have no plans. And that's actually also a, a time and where you feel a lot of maybe shame or guilt for not being in contact with your family mm -hmm. and, or feeling a little bit alone. And so there's all types of experience around this season. Um, and it's really important to, you know, if it's, and, and I think this, this episode, according to, to what we talked about is mostly when you, when you are, when you, when you do have plans and there's mm -hmm. family members or, or people there that demand a lot from you and they're, yeah. um, and it's difficult to deal with them because, you know, maybe you don't know how to say no with them. You know, if you, if you need time for yourself or, or you don't know how to set the boundaries around those people. And it can be very emotionally, um, exhausting. Yeah, it can be. And I'm sure a lot of people listening are just nodding their heads like, yep, <laughs> I've been there. Or I know I'm walking into that this Thanksgiving or this Christmas or whatever holiday it is that someone listening celebrates. So do you have any tool, a tool someone could work on today to be ready come that holiday? I do. I do. And, you know, it's mostly around setting boundaries because I think that's yeah. what most people struggle with um, during this season. Um, and I think w one of the most important tools I can give you is to be very aware of what is your focus around the holidays. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's gratitude, it's if it's just you know, spiritual traditions, or if it's spending time with your family, or if it's finding peace, you know, what is your purpose around this season? And having that purpose and that, and that meaning very present mm. within yourself, it's going to help you not go out of track. And, and just making sure that that you're focusing on your needs, you know, what are your needs, needs around this season? 
and being very aware that you're not letting other people's needs step on your own. So once you've established that need for yourself, it's easier to set the boundaries? Yes, because you're not just, you're not opening yourself up to people putting their needs like and, and, and having you sacrifice your own mm-hmm. because you're already very clear on what you want and what you don't want in this season. Especially for someone who does not set boundaries right now is kind of the yes person, even though it puts them in situations they don't want to be in. What can these boundaries look like? I read a post the other day and I quote her a lot um, from Nicola Pera from her Instagram account is the holistic psychologist And she gave some language to setting boundaries. So, for example, I am going to head upstairs and get some quiet time. That's very clear. That boundary is very, very clear. I need some quiet time, so I'm going to head upstairs. That's it. Mm -hmm. Let's not, let's say, and this family member is discussing a topic that you don't feel comfortable um, talking about. And a a boundary can be literally, let's not discuss this topic, Mm. you know, or I'm not comfortable talking about this subject right now. Please, let's change the subject. Mm -hmm. That's a very clear boundary. And another one that she mentions here is we won't be able to stay tonight, but we're really looking forward to dinner. So, you know, if this person is inviting you and to do stuff with them and you are very, and you really don't want to spend a lot of time around them because it's very hard for you to stay in your integrity when you're with them. Mm -hmm. And saying something like that can be useful, you know, to setting boundaries around the time that Mm -hmm. you're willing to spend with them. And another one is, I don't know if they comment around your, your eating habits or, your weight or the job that you're in or the relationship you're in setting boundaries around that. Like I'm not, I'm not willing to discuss this with you or, you know, I, there, there, there's just so many things you can say, but the clearer that you are, the more clear you are, the better. Mm, I like that a lot of these can be used in the middle of the situation. Like, I'm going to walk away from this right now. I'm going to go get, I'm going to go take a breath upstairs. I love that you can use that in the middle of the situation. Is any of this worthy of talking about before going to Thanksgiving dinner or before going to a celebration with your family? Should you have the conversation beforehand? I'm coming. I'm excited to be there, but I do not want to talk about my relationship. I don't know how to talk about my weight, et cetera, et cetera. 100%. Yes, of course. If you, if your boundaries are very clear, if you, you know, you've, if you're listening to this podcast right now is because at some point in your life during the holidays, you've experienced um, uncomfortable and difficult situations. So you already know, you already have the heads up. (laughs) <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not like you're walking into <laughs> a place where you have no idea what's going to happen. No, you've already spent time with your family and friends um, at this time of the year. So you already know what you don't like. You know, you re- you already know what you're fearing. Mm-hmm. You already know what kind of what your needs are. So that's good. So, yes, having a conversation with that someone before the holidays arrive definitely can be very useful during the holidays because you already set the stage. You already set the expectations of what you want and don't want to happen. I'm sure there are some situations where maybe the person should not attend the dinner. (laughs) Maybe they should just avoid the family celebration altogether. Can you tell me about trying to decide whether to go in the first place? Definitely having a conversation about it with someone that you trust. It can be your partner or your friend or your therapist, but having the conversation and kind of weighing the, the pros and cons about attending the dinner or, or whatever you're invited to, it is something that's going to give you a lot of, of consciousness and information regarding and making that decision. And if, if, the, if the cons are way more like a lot more than the, than the pros, and you know it's going to affect your mental health, then 
definitely that's that's a no and 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 being able to say no to that invitation in a very assertive and clear way it, it's gonna help you 100 mm-hmm. percent. yeah mm-hmm. it's hard though it is hard it is hard and validating that decision within yourself it's it's important mm-hmm. you're honoring your needs like i said it's it's a difficult time sometimes because I don't know, because a lot of things happen and there's a lot of toxic relationships maybe and and you don't feel comfortable. You don't even feel safe around them. Mm -hmm. Honoring your needs and being able to to set boundaries with yourself. I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. If you're accustomed to meeting other needs, to to sacrificing yourself, to putting yourself in, in situations that are toxic, and if you're very accustomed to doing that, then then saying yes and putting yourself in that situation again, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. It's somehow comfortable because it's what you've done for a long time. So being able to set boundaries with your inner inner child that wants to be validated, that wants to be praised for attending the dinner, and that doesn't want to feel guilty, you know, setting boundaries with yourself and being able to say, hey, you know what? And this is not going to help me. This is not going to help my mental well well being. This is I've already experienced enough to be able to put myself in the same situation again. So I'm just going to say no mm-hmm. and validate that and take care of me. Mm-hmm. Is, if, there, is there a way to do that while still respecting another person, whether that be, you know, your mom or your dad or your uncle or your brother or your grandma or your sister, whoever it is, is there a way to honor the relationship in the, in the way that maybe, you know, your parent brought you into the world or whatever it is, but distance yourself from it? 100%. uh, I agree that there is a way. (laughs) Easier said than done, probably. (laughs) That's what it's called, compassionate and effective boundaries. Mm -hmm. We start with empathy because that's when we lower the emotional, the emotional reaction of the other person when we're able to be empathetic and say, hey, I know you want me to come and I know it's hard. It's very, you you were very excited about the holidays and to, you know, because you, you love being with the whole family. So I know it can be hard for you to hear me out and and empathize with me. So doing that, it definitely helps. And one of the things is that we should avoid the words, but however, instead, and because the thing is that but and however, Mm-hmm. invalidates everything you said before it. So so if you st- if you start with empathy and then you say but immediately the person gets reactive. Okay. The the but is like hey 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 what are you going to say next? Like this you know there's going to come like a negative side. But if you can validate the positive and the negative saying the words and or at the same time it definitely helps. So saying and and at the same time and then definitely also avoid labeling or name calling. Mm-hmm. So if, instead of saying in the past, you've been very controlling, you know, you don't want to say that at all. And owning your feelings, you know, saying I feel rather than you made me feel. Mm-hmm. And at the end, you offer a compromise or a choice. So I give some examples to, and to my clients. And for example, Instead of saying, stop trying to make me go to your dinner. You're a manipulator. You always make me feel guilty. You don't want to say that. Mm -hmm. You would say, I can see how difficult it is for you to not have me at your dinner. Empathize. Okay. Empathize. At the same time, you can can say in the past, um, you know, the last two years we've had many discussions and problems Mm. when we celebrate these holidays. We clash a lot and then it causes a lot of emotional disturbance for me and for you. And that's been really hard to recover from. So I already made other plans and and I hope you can really understand where I'm coming from. I'm really trying to take care of my needs and my well-being. And while I know it's really hard for you, I also know that it's going to be better for both of us to not spend this time together. 
Mm-hmm. I love that. You know what? I think I'm going to write that out verbatim and put it in show notes so someone can copy and paste it, you know, and, and <laughs> rehearse it because that's that's so good. I can see how you switched it from your controlling to I, I can see in the past we've had disagreements. I loved that. That was great. Yeah, we've had disagreements. It's caused a lot of turbulence yeah. in our life. It's it's alienated. It's been very alienating from each other emotionally. Mm-hmm. So I don't want that to to happen again. And and I decided that this year I wanna I wanna spend it apart. Even though inside I'm, I'm I really wanna I, I really wanna be together. But I've I've learned that maybe it's not the best time to be together during the holidays. Mm -hmm. Do you think that families put so much expectation on a holiday because it's the time they've all come together that that expectation is what kind of breaks things apart? Expectations are everything. They really are. And you you have this. I I, I wrote a post in my Instagram about Valentine's Day Uh (laughs) saying how hard it is sometimes you know, the, the husband, wife, or the partner, whoever, they're expecting the roses, they're expecting the, um, the, the love letter, you know, the uh, beautiful dinner. And I, I'm giving this example, but you can put it on any holiday. And then the holidays arrive and you don't get the flowers. And that's so disappointing. Mm-hmm. And so, so definitely, um, yes, expectations play a big, big role, specifically when you watch television and everything's being catered mm-hmm. to, the, to the united family, the healthy family that they all get along and they all love each other. And, and, and it's really hard when you don't have that type of family or when, when you don't have had those types of experiences in the past, it can be very, very stressful to, Mm -hmm. to accept. And you mentioned television. I think social media probably doesn't make things easier because you're seeing what looks like the perfect family all over your friends and their perfect families and their perfect dinners or their perfect Valentine's day all over social media, which I'm sure doesn't help that. Yeah. You can see everything catered and, and you can see tons of presents and mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. wearing new decorated pajamas <laughs> <laughs> eating eating feasts and everybody's hugging each other and being so nice to each other and 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 yeah we parents and 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 siblings can go overboard with you know with with really putting those expectations on you that you maybe don't don't want for yourself so so it is hard if you are walking into, or maybe your whole family, is there something, a way to check your expectations before you walk into something like this, a family gathering? I think it can be as simple as asking yourself that question, you know, what are my expectations this holiday? And I, we can do that not only in the holidays, but the rest of the year, you know, what are, what are my expectations? And am I expecting to receive this big gift Am I expecting a big welcome with a hug? Am I expecting um, to have this type of conversation or for my mom or dad to not mention how hard it has been for me, I don't know, to get pregnant? You know, what am I expecting? What, what expectations I'm putting on the other person? And if you are, if you're putting those expectations if, and if, it, if it's a need then like we said at the beginning, like let's have the conversation with them about it. Yeah. And if it's not a need, then, then relieving them of those expectations, you know, maybe I'll get a gift. Maybe I won't, maybe I'll get a hug. Maybe I won't. And, and, and saying that to yourself, I think it definitely helps to, to enter the, the, the house or the dinner and with a, with an open mind, with, with curiosity, mm. curiosity for me is the key. Do you think that sometimes people get caught on the other side instead of expecting a lot of great things, expecting the worst that probably doesn't help either. Definitely. And it doesn't help either. I agree because then you tend to react when the worst comes mm-hmm. because it's like, I knew it. I knew it. This was going to happen. I knew we couldn't have a great um, a normal dinner. Like mm. I just knew it. So you put those expectations, then it happens and it kind of, it, and it is kind of like the self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm-hmm. So the person says the comment that you were fearing and you're like, your whole evening goes to the, 
ground because it was like you were expecting this to happen Mm -hmm. when it could have just been like, I just don't like that comment and let's go on. So you, I cut you off as you were talking about curiosity. And I think when we talk about the good and the bad expectations, curiosity is going to be really key here. So tell me about the practical way to bring that curiosity as you're going into that event. So becoming comfortable with not knowing. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's really important. We we don't like to not know. We like to predict things. (laughs) Mm-hmm. We, we don't like uncertainty. So what happens is that not knowing leaves space for assumption making. So when we don't know, we start assuming the best or the worst, but we assume. And, and it doesn't help at all because we just talked about all the ways we, it doesn't help. So we, we have to get comfortable. We have to get comfortable with not knowing and allow ourselves to not know and open ourselves up to curiosity. So a lot of times when a client comes to my practice and they tell me, I'm so sure that I'm going to come home and, and, and the keys are not going to be in the table where I always ask my mother-in-law to put there, you know, to, to put. Mm-hmm. So, and I tell her, okay, tell me three other things that can happen when you go home with, in terms of the keys. And they would say like, well, Maybe they are in the table or maybe my husband grabbed them. So maybe that's the reason we're, they're not there. Or maybe, maybe, I don't know, the keys got lost. And, you know, like I don't know. I just gave that example to give an example. But there's so many scenarios, mm-hmm. so many. There's a million scenarios. But we, because we want to know, we assume one from the million scenarios that could happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Being very mindful about opening ourselves up to that curiosity, to not knowing, to the million scenarios that can happen, it, it helps us not react mm-hmm. when we're yeah. in the situation and maybe it happens. In your or maybe it doesn't. Yeah, I really, really like that idea because you. I think there's also an element maybe of control. You want to kind of control the, the scenario that's coming out of whatever situation. Yeah. Can you tell me about, in your practice, what you've learned about the dynamic of the grown child and the parent's relationship? Is there something that a lot of those relationships seem to be missing? Yes. So I just want to comment before I answer that. You just said... talked about control and there's a paradox that's very important that I always explain it to my clients that while we attempt to control others in situations we are actually being controlled we're trying to control others but we are actually being controlled why because we gain self-worth only when we get the desired outcome Mm. so we really have to radically accept that we're never in control We're never in control. So about the question that you said, that you just asked about Mm -hmm. the adult child with parents, um, I think it varies with every family. Like every family is different and and they have their own dynamics. But the dynamics that I usually see is the enmeshment dynamics where, you know, when we're your, your... we are different depending on who we are with. Mm-hmm. So we're a person when we're with our clients. We're someone else when, when, we're, when we're with our partners, when we're, when we're with our kids. And definitely when we're with our parents, we're a completely different person. We, are, we kind of tend to go back to being kids. Mm. And, and if you didn't have a great relationship with your parents or if your parents had a lot of control over you, when you go back to being with your parents, you're going to, you're going to experience all those emotions again. Sometimes parents have a tendency to, to treat their other adult children as children again. Mm -hmm. And that definitely creates a kind of clash between them because adults don't want to be treated as children. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of, of, of issues uh, surrounding this topic that I see in therapy. Is there a way to start healing that relationship? There is a way. And, and I think the way is being transparent about it. And it's not, an, it's, it's not easy at all. 
and because there's gonna you're gonna encounter a lot of resistance from your parents but being courageous and start being transparent about the way you feel it's gonna be a starting point for changes to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be hard to be the parent to hear this coming from that kid you raised, you did the best you could, et cetera, et cetera, with the tools you had. But then you hear this from your child. What can you do if you're the parent to get there on the same level and get there to do some healing that obviously the child's trying to say they need? Yeah. So for the parent, definitely there's a lot um, of resistance and it's really, really hard for them to hear that, like you said. And I think it's a matter of understanding that has nothing to do with you. Like it's not, it's nothing personal. Hmm. It's more about the needs of your adult child. It's about needs. That's all. We tend to, everything that's said to us, we tend to view it as something that we did wrong. And it's not at all like that. It's mostly about them, their need to to start being independent, to make their own decisions, to to be able to be, to be free of judgment. Mm. I love that it comes back to needs because I think so often in this, these this communication we have with other people just in general, we're looking for someone who's at fault. But instead of looking for someone who's at fault, we're looking for the needs that need to be met. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's, that is so cool. You mentioned, I'm trying to think of other relationships that are really difficult. And you mentioned in-laws. So let's talk about that because I know a lot of people struggle with their in-laws. What's the, what are some good tips for that dynamic in dealing with in-laws? Yes, definitely. That's a huge, huge um, topic surrounding the holidays. (laughs) Um, I think it's really important for you to have that conversation with your partner before the holidays come. And again, set the expectations Mm. with your partner, you know, talking about the way you feel when you're with your in-laws the way you feel that your boundaries are being breached when you're with them, your needs, you know, what are your expectations? All of that, all of that um, uh, conversation surrounding, you know, surrounding boundaries, it's, it's huge. And being able to, to also understand the reaction of your partner, it's also important because a lot of times when our partners feel we kind of criticize their partner, their parents, I'm sorry, they can get defensive Mm -hmm. and understanding that that's normal and validating their feelings without invalidating your own. That's going to be a very important step in the process. Like I understand this is hard to hear from for you because they're your parents and and you're already accustomed to, to those behaviors, but I'm not accustomed and I'm not comfortable when they do this. It would be really helpful for me as your partner to to also be validated as I'm validating you and kind of have a conversation around how are we going to manage this? Mm. How are you going to help me and support me with my needs and feelings that I'm expressing right now? If you're the listening partner, how can you stand in solidarity while honoring your family? Yes, you can say this is hard to hear. You know, definitely this is hard to hear (laughs) Um, because they're my parents and I know they're doing the best they can. They are actually trying to be very good parents-in-law and and it's hard for me to hear how their attempts of being good are affecting you. Mm. So I I can validate and, and, and attempt to understand where you're coming from and make sense of it and help you because obviously I don't want you to feel this way when, when we're around them. And at the same time, it's really hard to hear for me and let's talk more about it. Let me be more curious about your situation and why you feel so uncomfortable with them when they do this or when they do that. And how would you like me to, to be an ally? You know, how would you like, what would you like me to do? Like, tell me a little bit, what are your ideas of how can I help you get along better with them? Mm. I love this because it's a team. That's how you would talk to any teammate. Like if you were playing a sport, that's how you talk to a teammate. How are we going to solve this? 
Exactly. Are there any other relationships that come up when you're in practice? Siblings. <laughs> <laughs> how did I miss that one? So how do you deal <laughs> with your siblings? Well, mostly with siblings, what I've experienced in my private practice is that there's a lot of competition. Mm. And even when you're an adult, you know, if you haven't addressed that in therapy or, or in the relationship, the competition tends to go on. And I think I just I just think it's important to be to be aware of that dynamic and 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 make conscious choices to not to not compare, you know, mm-hmm. to contrast. To contrast. If you, I think it's if important. You, if you've started yeah. to step out of that and you as the individual say, Okay, we have this lifetime of competing with each other, I don't want to compare and compete anymore, is there a way or some words to use that can disarm the sibling. For example, tell me something that the sibling would say. Oh, I I don't know. I'm thinking like, can you go to a sibling and say, look, I don't want to compare our lives anymore. I'm done. (laughs) Can we just move forward? (laughs) (laughs) I think that... I don't think you have to say that. I think I think it's like, do you know the saying that to fight, there, there needs to be two people? Mm-hmm. And I think it's the same thing. Like, you know, you, you don't have to enter the game if you don't want to. Mm. So if somebody says something that you know it's coming from a comparison, comparison um, stance... You don't have to enter. You can be actually, you can actually validate and, and praise whatever they're saying. Like, that's amazing. I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you. And I, I'm so glad you're exercising. And I actually haven't found the, the right type of exercise for me. You know, mm. Mm. it's amazing like that. that you, that you already have three kids and I'm actually waiting a little bit more. So I, can reach a state in my life where I'm a little bit more prepared. Mm-hmm. You know, but you don't have to enter um, the the comparison. You you don't have to if you don't want to. But it has to be a conscious choice. Mm. So tell me a little bit. You started to talk about contrasting, and you just gave me the examples of contrasting. But what makes contrasting different than comparing? Contrasting. Well, I usually define it as. Instead of being a we, I'm me. Mm. Like instead of thinking of us is each other, you know, we're each a person with individual needs, individual characteristics, strengths, weaknesses. We're different. We're, we're a whole world. You know, even if we were born in the same womb, you know, if you're twins. <laughs> <laughs> And, and contrasting is basically that is allowing ourselves to be authentic and, and embracing every single part of, of, of ourselves. You know, if it's something you don't like, embrace it. If it's something you like, embrace it, you know, if, and, and, and being very aware of not entering into that comparison trap, you know, if that person is more, I don't know, um, good looking, intelligent, has a better job or whatever. Amazing. Be proud of them. What do you have? What do you have that makes you, you not that they don't have the question is what do you, the question is not what do you have that they don't have? No. The question is what do you have that makes you, you? Oh, I love that. That the because I think we go to that question. But what do I have that they don't have? That's so great. If someone is listening and they're like, "Yeah, but I'm really I struggle not comparing because you know they've got the job and they've got the partner, they've got the house, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Where would you have that person start? Just with that question, what makes you you? I think it's embracing and accepting all parts of you, Mm -hmm. all of them. And a lot of people think that if they accept the things they don't like, then they're going to get stuck in those things. But I think, and and the research says that it's the contrary. The more you accept yourself, the more you're able to strive to change Mm -hmm. because you start loving yourself. Mm -hmm. You start loving yourself. and And when we love someone, we want the best for them. 
Mm-hmm. So if we love ourselves, we're going to want the best for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And the only way to love ourselves is to love all parts of us. We cannot not accept something because you, we feel it's shameful. Mm-hmm. You know, the more we open ourselves up to saying, yes, that's part of me right now, right now in the present moment, that's part of me. It's not the whole me, but it's part of me. And I accept it as it is. And while I accept it, I'm also going to strive to change it for the better. Mm-hmm. But we, but there has to be both there, acceptance and change. You cannot change without acceptance. Mm-hmm. If you reject something you have, you will enter into a loop of rejection. It's like you're circling around the fact that it's not fair and you don't like it. And it isn't supposed to be this way. So with that, with that mentality, with, uh, with spending most of your time and energy re- re- rejecting, you don't have the space and the energy to change. Mm. And you just keep going in that circle. Yeah, and you just keep going into that sort of, yeah. and it becomes even bigger with more things that you start rejecting. So I'm I love this conversation because we're talking about dealing with difficult family members, but we started this conversation with getting in tune with your needs, and we're ending the conversation with figuring out how to love yourself. So it really comes back to being in tune with yourself. Yeah. I love that. Okay, the last question I always like to ask all my guests, because this podcast is about finding more joy in the everyday, I want to ask you your number one tip for finding more joy in the everyday, in the good, the bad, the in-between, what would be your advice? Gratitude. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I love that one. Yeah, gratitude for sure. You know, and and radical acceptance and and gratitude. Radical acceptance is, I just talked about radical sex self-acceptance. Radical acceptance is understanding that life is, has amazing things in it. And it also has a lot of terrible things in it. You Mm -hmm. know, there's, there's, a lot of pain in life and there's a lot of joy also if you allow it to be there and with pain we can experience joy with suffering we cannot Mm. and suffering is when we reject so when we radically accept we can allow pain to be there while experiencing joy and and yeah and definitely gratitude i think we can find something we can be grateful for in every situation. Mm-hmm. I think you're and right. That, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I so appreciate you taking the time to do this podcast episode. And I, I know it's going to help listeners who are entering those situations these holidays. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniel. I was, I'm so happy you invited me and that I was able to provide value to your listeners. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful that Stephanie spent her time on the podcast to share these tools with us. I will link all of her information, including how to follow her on Instagram in show notes. Okay, guys, I got to tease next, next episode because it will be episode 100. (laughs) I can't even believe it, but we are to episode 100. It's going to be an awesome show. So I hope you will stick around for that. Make sure you're subscribed if you haven't subscribed yet. Thanks for being here on Happiness and Progress. Thank you.